Hi, this is the AI Storyteller. I'm Mark. In this issue, we interpret one of the mid-to-late career representative works of Ian McEwan, a Booker Prize winner and one of the most important contemporary British writers. The featured novel is the lengthy one titled Sweet Tooth, published in 2015. We have previously explored his most significant work, Atonement. However, for those who want to gain a more detailed understanding of his key technical features, identify the major challenges he faced, and discover the most moving parts of his writing, the novel Sweet Tooth, published in 2015, is a very suitable choice. In this novel, we will see how a matured writer approaches the complexity of contemporary international politics, ponders the relationship between individuals and society, constructs a compelling story from intricate materials, and displays almost all writing techniques within limited space. For literary enthusiasts interested in exploring creative writing, Sweet Tooth is a textbook-level demonstration. In our previous analysis of Atonement, we have already provided a detailed introduction to McEwen's life story and creative experiences. Therefore, in this analysis, we will first narrate the story and then intertwine his life experiences related to the novel's plot. Now, let's directly enter the story, immersing ourselves in the thick iron curtains of the Cold War era. The beginning of Sweet Tooth reads like a story synopsis written in the first person by the female protagonist. Let me read the first paragraph. My name is Serena Frome, rhymes with plume, and almost forty years ago I was sent on a secret mission for the British Security Service. I didn't return safely. Within eighteen months of joining I was sacked, having disgraced myself and ruined my lover, though he certainly had a hand in his own undoing. From a plot perspective, this passage by Serena essentially summarizes the entire story's setup. When a novelist dares to adopt such a stance in the opening paragraph, it signifies his confidence in narrative control, without concern that this will diminish the suspense. The incompetence of her younger sister, in turn, added to the responsibilities on the shoulders of the obedient Serena. After arriving at Cambridge, she discovered that her mathematical talent was only sufficient for excelling in secondary school, and she couldn't cope with a world-class university like Cambridge. In fatigue and disappointment, she chose to find solace in literary works and gradually became enamored with the writings of the Soviet writer Solzhenitsyn. Solzhenitsyn's indictment of the Gulag labor camps resonated with Serena's Western ideological upbringing in a conservative family. To young Serena, the world seemed either black or white, and the Cold War had only two possible outcomes, victory or defeat, with the East and West as irreconcilable adversaries. However, in the 1960s and 1970s, most intellectuals and in schools questioned various flaws in capitalist society, became disillusioned about the future, and Serena, standing firmly in the conservative camp, found herself at odds with her surroundings. Nevertheless, her actions caught the attention of Tony Canning, a history professor in his early fifties, who quickly won the affection of the fatherless Serena with his profound knowledge and refined demeanor. By the second chapter of the novel, they had become lovers. Under Tony's tutelage, Serena learned to approach problems like a typical conservative elite and to conduct herself accordingly. Soon after, Serena was abruptly abandoned during an argument Tony had deliberately orchestrated. However, it was during Tony's unannounced departure that he left her with the opportunity to work for MI5, the British intelligence agency. Serena passed the interview and didn't discover until several months later that Tony had an incurable illness and had chosen to spend his final days on a remote island. The breakup had been Tony's plan all along, and his initial grooming of her was meant to prepare her to become a competent spy. Despite many lingering doubts, Serena eventually accepted this setup. This job and mission were the legacy left to her by her mentor and lover, Tony. McEwen's novels are known for their substantial depth, and in the first two chapters, he not only advances the plot but also provides a wealth of information about the era. For instance, we see the social challenges faced by Britain in the 1970s, severe divisions among intellectuals, the pervasive influence of the Cold War in everyday life, and the sudden decline of the vibrant 1960s counterculture movement, which left many disillusioned and weary young people stranded. Here, it's necessary to provide some background on the Cold War explaining what it was. 
In history textbooks, the Cold War typically refers to the political, economic, and military struggle between the capitalist camp, led by the United States and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, and the socialist camp, led by the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact, from 1947 to 1991. During this period, despite significant differences and conflicts, both sides sought to avoid large-scale global warfare. Instead, their confrontations typically occurred through cold means, including technological and arms races, the space race, and diplomatic competitions, hence the term Cold War, characterized by mutual containment without the use of force. Before writing Sweet Tooth, Ian McEwen conducted extensive research on espionage history during the period. He even attempted to apply for a position at MI5 with his son through the internet, answering a few inexplicable questions. However, his attempt was unsuccessful. Nevertheless, it was his strong interest in this subject matter and thorough research that allowed us to see many descriptions in Sweet Tooth that break away from the stereotypical portrayal of the espionage industry. In McEwen's portrayal, MI5 and MI6 are not the mysterious, all-powerful intelligence agencies depicted in the James Bond film series. Most of the individuals working within these agencies are not handsome, highly intelligent special agents. Sweet Tooth deliberately distances itself from the conventional and cliched portrayal of espionage, and instead, we see budget constraints, bureaucratic office politics, and absurdity. At the outset, Serena is merely a low-ranking clerical assistant, burdened by the unwritten consensus within MI5 that women cannot keep secrets. Her outspoken colleague and close friend, Shirley, is sent to test Serena's political inclinations and ultimately resigns due to internal pressures. Serena's immediate boss, Max, who is clearly smitten by her beauty, struggles to suppress his feelings and falsely announces his impending engagement to someone else. Meanwhile, Serena frequently senses that she is being watched and surveilled by eyes hidden in the shadows. All these undercurrents swirling within the office exude a sense of commonplace absurdity. In this context, Serena, a striking figure within MI5 and the only novelist enthusiastic about reading, is given a special assignment, Operation Sweet Tooth. This operation, in the form of a foundation, indirectly and discreetly funds authors who align with British interests ideologically and have a public influence. Serena's mission is to get close to the only novelist involved in this operation, the up-and-coming Tom Haley. The fusion of literature and espionage in Operation Sweet Tooth isn't a purely fictional scenario. There has always been a deep connection between the British literary world and the intelligence community. As we've previously explored, authors like Somerset Maugham, Graham Greene, John Le Caire, and Ian Fleming, who wrote the James Bond series, all had backgrounds in the world of espionage. This connection serves as part of the inspiration for Sweet Tooth. What more directly motivated McEwen's writing was the declassification of archives in recent years concerning the soft Cold War. This includes the global promotion of George Orwell's works 1984 and Animal Farm by the British Foreign Office's Information Research Department, as well as the CIA's funding of Dr. Zhivago. As we mentioned while analyzing Dr. Zhivago, the CIA printed many pocket editions of the novel and distributed them for free at various international events. These real events provided the historical basis for McEwen to construct Operation Sweet Tooth. Regardless of where or when authors put pen to paper, they cannot predict, or at least fully predict, the ultimate fate of their works. Once completed, facing readers, their works may be understood and interpreted, but they may also be distorted or exploited, becoming tools of certain ideologies. This is the inevitable fate of literature. Sweet Tooth reveals this fate accurately and soberly, without a word, yet it's a heart-pounding read that keeps you on the edge of your seat. It's worth noting that although Operation Sweet Tooth is ostensibly a weapon in the cultural Cold War, with significant official importance attached to it, the novel subtly suggests, through dialogues among the higher-ups at MI5 and the interplay of events, that Operation Sweet Tooth is merely a bureaucratic game, a byproduct of complex office politics. This is because, during the deadlock of the Cold War, the contradictions between MI5 and MI6 were becoming increasingly pronounced. Their relationship resembled two competing departments within the same company, 
both vying for already limited internal resources and trying to claim credit in front of their superiors. External pressure came from the delicate relationship between British intelligence agencies and the financially powerful CIA, since the CIA had already created successful cases like Dr. Zhivago, the British couldn't afford to fall behind. How to seize the opportunity to outshine MI6 in this war without gunfire was a prime concern. McEwen's summary of Operation Sweet Tooth is pointedly accurate. It was madness. It was how those spook bureaucracies kept themselves in work. Who knows which self-important young man with an ambiguous dream came up with it to ingratiate himself with his superiors. But no one knows why, or to what purpose. No one even asked? However, returning to the plot, the story reaches its eleventh chapter, and the male protagonist, Tom, makes his first appearance. At that time, he was still working as a university lecturer, and Serena, assuming the role of a foundation employee, takes a train to meet him. Before this encounter, Serena hastily did some research and read some of his works. In fact, the subsequent plot involves readers following Serena as she gradually becomes acquainted with Tom as a person while simultaneously reading and discussing his works. In other words, the act of reading and the act of getting to know a person go hand in hand. As their intimacy deepens, Serena even offers suggestions for revisions to one of Tom's short stories, intervening in his creative process. Here, we can clearly sense that Sweet Tooth is not just constructing a relationship between spy and target, nor is it solely a relationship between two young individuals. It's also a clever metaphor for the interactive relationship between a novelist and readers, commentators. Tom is a young novelist on the rise in the literary world, full of various possibilities in his writing career and life choices. McEwen himself has acknowledged in interviews that he didn't shy away from drawing inspiration for this character from his own life. Like Tom, he too moved from a small town to London in the early 1970s, came from an ordinary family background in education, and only had the chance to make a name for himself in the literary world through diligent writing and experimenting with various styles. Many of the people Tom encounters and interacts with in the literary circle in the novel bear similarities to McEwen's own experiences. The portrayal of the literary landscape in 1970s Britain comes vividly to life in Sweet Tooth. In Sweet Tooth, a total of six novels written by Tom are featured, and all six of these novels have intricate connections to Ian McEwen's own body of work. Among these, three of the novels have prototypes that can be found in McEwen's early short story collections. This setup is not just the author's nostalgia or self-indulgence, as these three novels were indeed representative of the cutting-edge style prevalent in mainstream literature at the time. McEwen himself, who rose to prominence in the British literary scene in the 1970s and 1980s, was a representative of this new wave of writers. The other three works presented in Sweet Tooth are revealed to readers through Serena's reading and recounting, and they are closer to McEwen's current style, providing a deliberate contrast with the first three. The latter part of the novel also hints that after the events of Operation Sweet Tooth, Tom will undergo a significant change in his writing style. Of course, Tom is by no means Ian McEwen himself, and in his own career, McEwen has never experienced the legendary adventures of a female spy. Serena's operation Sweet Tooth progresses smoothly, and Tom believes he is receiving support from the Cultural Foundation, so he resigns from his teaching position to focus on writing the novel he has always wanted to write but couldn't do to financial constraints. It's not difficult to guess that Serena and Tom soon fall in love deeply and navigate the complexities of love, both genuine and feigned, reaching a point of no return in their relationship. As their feelings deepen, Serena's guilt also grows. Just when she hesitates to confess her love for Tom, a significant turning point occurs in the story. As mentioned earlier, Serena's boss, Max, has been suppressing his infatuation with Serena. When he discovers that Serena has fallen in love with Tom, he cannot contain his jealousy. He goes to great lengths, even breaking off his engagement to his fiancée, in hopes of winning Serena's affections, but is met with rejection. Consequently, Max anonymously leaks information about Operation Sweet Tooth to the media, strategically timing it to coincide with Tom's recent literary award win. 
Suddenly, sensational headlines about this newly celebrated author being a puppet of MI5 filled the newspapers. Photos of Tom and Serena embracing on the beach are published, and reporters describe Serena as Tom's sexy spy. Everything seems to be accelerating irreversibly like an avalanche. Serena's reputation is ruined, and her career prospects at MI5 come to a halt. Meanwhile, the leadership at MI5 confronts her, and her mentor and former lover, Tony, is posthumously revealed to have a record of betrayal. As a result, Serena herself is never fully trusted, and her actions are constantly monitored. Overnight, Serena's job, beliefs, and cherished memories crumble one after another, and it seems like her fate has hit rock bottom. She rushes to Tom's residence to salvage their love, only to find it vacant. In despair, she discovers a letter from Tom in the kitchen. This lengthy letter comprises the final chapter of the novel, and in this chapter, Ian McEwan not only climaxes the plot but also executes a remarkably clever twist. In the letter, Tom revisits the entire process, but this time, the narrative perspective shifts to his own. As it turns out, several months ago, Max had already approached Tom, hoping to use the truth to halt Tom and Serena's love affair. Tom, after initially reacting with anger and sorrow, gradually calms down. Memories of his time with Serena flood back like a tide, and all of it condensed into a solid body, a fine joint of meat turning on the spit, and he suddenly realizes that he had been so absorbed by the disgrace of it that I didn't see it was an opportunity, a gift. The outline for his next novel emerges in this moment of revelation. Tom decides to continue his relationship with Serena, all the while secretly observing and documenting her activities as a spy. Simultaneously, he starts collecting every piece of information he can find about Serena, creating a fictional past for her based on real events and conducting a psychological analysis. Through this process, Tom undergoes a significant psychological transformation himself. Initially, he thinks, we were both spying. You were deceiving me, I was probing you. I could seal it up between the covers of a book and cut you off from myself but when he realizes that he must fully immerse himself in Serena's shoes, thinking from her perspective, to truly write this character well, he falls deeper into this endeavor. He decides to write in the first person from Serena's perspective, declaring affectionately, to create you on the page, I have to become you, understand you, and that's what fiction demands. There's a necessary consequence. When I pour myself into your skin, I'm supposed to guess at this. I love you. No, that's wrong. I love you more. It's not until the closing lines of this letter that the reader finally comprehends that all of Serena's self-narratives in the preceding 21 chapters of the novel were, in fact, written by Tom. He contemporaneously recorded events as they unfolded and completed the manuscript after the scandal was exposed. He proposes to Serena with this manuscript. If she declines, he will burn it. If she accepts, they will live together keeping the manuscript until the 21st century, when the official Secrets Act's retrospective reach has passed, and then publish it. This implies that, as readers, since we've read this letter and this book, this novel and this love story have achieved a fulfilling conclusion. In the final chapter of Sweet Tooth, the three crucial elements of the novel, espionage, romance, and literature, miraculously converge. To create you on the page, I have to become you, Understand You encapsulates the shared pursuit of these three elements. Whether it's becoming the finest spy, experiencing a remarkable love affair, or crafting an outstanding novel, they all require this boundary-blurring state, immersing oneself completely, imagining oneself as another, fully embracing their perspective and thoughts, and ultimately blending together into one. After completing the entire story, Let's take a closer look at how Sweet Tooth differs significantly from typical spy novels. Stripping away the outer shell of the spy novel, we discover that the following three aspects are crucial in Sweet Tooth, while they are often ignored or downplayed in traditional spy novels. Firstly, Sweet Tooth vividly reconstructs the social landscape of the Cold War era with rich details and a fresh perspective. Within its relatively short length, the novel showcases Ian McEwan's skill in blending historical politics into the minutiae of daily life through limited viewpoints. It offers a panoramic view of the complexities of political and social life. 
Secondly, the novel uses the backdrop of a half-hearted cultural Cold War narrative to reveal the challenges people, especially intellectuals, face in maintaining independent thinking and inner freedom. These challenges are often subtle, insidious, and can turn one's initial idealism into a bitter joke. When you think you have gained freedom, when you believe you are thinking with your own mind, it could be the beginning of your control and imprisonment. If we expand the concept of this invisible prison, it can encompass many complex issues in the world. McEwen avoids letting the author's stance interfere with the reader's perspective, and he exercises restraint in jumping into the fray of ideological judgments. Lastly, and most importantly, Sweet Tooth explores narrative techniques and reflects on the essence of storytelling. After uncovering the ending's mystery and experiencing the impact of the pivotal twist, looking back, you can see how intricately and delicately the preceding 21 chapters were written. Readers sensitive to structure may also gain insights into Tom's novel, fooling around in bed, halfway through the total page count. You can easily view this story as a metaphor for the entire novel or Tom and Serena's entire love affair. From reading to understanding people, from capturing to being captured, from completing a mission to destroying it, from deceiving to being deceived, these elements, under McEwen's pen, become intricate and convincing emotional catalysts. The criticism that overly skilled techniques result in a lack of genuine emotional power is often leveled at McEwen's recent works. However, Sweet Tooth is an exception. When Tom and Serena's emotions are refracted through a complex prism, when reality no longer has a single dimension as in many traditional novels, the emotional power in Sweet Tooth is exceptionally profound in many chapters. McEwen superbly demonstrates that emotion and technique are not mutually exclusive. A well-crafted structure can provide a unique and expansive space for emotional expression. All of the key themes in Sweet Tooth politics and literature, spy and writer, reader and author, deception and love, are given new meanings through the final chapter's reversal. Once you know the ending, revisiting Tom's fictionalized first-person accounts of Serena, which you've become familiar with in the preceding chapters, takes on a new significance. For example, many passages earlier in the book are written in Serena's voice, describing Tom. After finishing the book and knowing the twist, you can imagine these words as being written by a male author, imagining himself through the lens of his lover and then critically evaluating himself. We've seen similar reversal elements in our previous discussion of atonement, but McEwen has clearly found a more intricate way to penetrate the details, elevating this twist, both in technical difficulty and in the force with which it propels the narrative. McEwen once said that the reason he chose the surname from for the female protagonist in Sweet Tooth and rhymed it with plumage in the very first sentence was to imply to the reader, and more importantly, to remind himself, that the most crucial theme in Sweet Tooth is who controls the narrative, who holds the pen. This intention runs through the entire novel and constitutes one of the most unforgettable aspects of this atypical espionage story. So, in this installment, we've discussed the following key points. 1. McEwen's novels are known for their dense content. In Sweet Tooth, we see a wealth of historical context and an exploration of the socio-political challenges faced by Britain in the 1970s. Intellectuals are deeply divided, and Cold War ideology infiltrates everyday life. The once vibrant counterculture of the 1960s, epitomized by the hippie movement, is receding, leaving a disillusioned and weary generation in its wake. 2. The novel uses the backdrop of an unfinished cultural Cold War narrative to reveal the difficulties individuals, especially intellectuals, face in maintaining independent thought and inner freedom. These difficulties are often subtle and gradual, transforming one's initial ideals into bitter irony. Just when you think you've gained freedom and are using your own mind, it might be the start of your control and imprisonment. Expanding this concept of an invisible prison can encompass many complex issues in the world. 3. Sweet Tooth is exceptionally rich in emotional power in many chapters, even when scrutinized by those who claim that McEwen's technically adept writing sometimes lacks genuine emotional force. McEwen effectively demonstrates that emotion and technique are not mutually exclusive. A well-crafted structure can provide a unique and expansive space for emotional expression. Well, that concludes the content for this episode. 
If you enjoyed my video, please click like, subscribe to my channel, and share it with your friends. Thank you.